And in 05, the very next year, I'm working with that same cool group of uh, sheriffs that brought us in as equals. And we get ambushed. There's three game wardens, three sheriff's deputies, and an unarmed park ranger going into what we thought was a five to 7,000 plant trespass grow, all toxically tainted with these EPA banned nerve agents, and anticoagulant poisons I mentioned. We didn't know that yet. We weren't, we weren't privy to any of that knowledge of what these poisons were, but we were rating grow after grow with those in them. And basically these guys had been in play for about 10 years and five or six massive grow patches over a mile of ridgeline and on public land in the Silicon Valley foothills. And I shot a multi-million dollar tech company owners homes and just wreaking havoc encampments with the satellite encampments, you know, tunnel trails that kind of came together in spider web escape routes uh, noisemakers, um, snares, you know, around camp to grab people or animals. Uh, we didn't know it, but we'd start to see him building punji pits just right out of Viet Cong tactics. Going back to the Vietnam conflict, we'd Crazy. see those in national parks in 2014, 2015, when our Met team was running hot. I mean, Clint, this is in California, in the Silicon Valley. And unbeknownst to me, because my, you know, right now my vision is like this. I'm kind of microcosmic in my little district as a lieutenant that's supervising 2.5 counties of the Bay area, but I didn't know it was in, you know, 50 plus counties in California. And I didn't know at the time that these cartels were embedded like 20 other States growing cannabis and that they had any involvement in methamphetamine production nationally, human trafficking, synthetic fentanyl. Now that's killing a bunch of people. And, you know, it's gone into these, you know, dirty labs making these lookalike prescription opiates that, or opioid painkillers that every third pill, you just die in, in seconds, if not minutes. I didn't know it was that big. I just saw environmental criminals that were really heavily armed and I wanted to take them out. It mm. was that simple. Yeah. Um, and we got ambushed by one uh, SKS, you know, wielding gunman from, he was in a fortified position. We were at tactical disadvantage with the early morning light going slightly uphill. They had a parapet dug where they were burying trash, but they had a really good overwatch position. They got one shot off. It went through both legs of my warden partner who had trained in the academy about six months before that. Great young man. So he's bleeding out of four holes. And now we're in a gunfight where I'm engaging the guy that's coming around the corner that shot him and is trying to finish the job. While another sheriff's deputy is engaging a suspect that's got a sawed off shotgun on me and another warden at seven yards away through a canopy of brush and marijuana that we can't even see this bad guy. And before he's about to take a shot and take my head off snake, i.e. deputy Craig diver took that guy out. And I wouldn't be talking to you, brother, if he didn't make that move. So in that day, so we're working with three really dialed in sheriff's deputies, all military veterans, all on their SWAT and sniper teams. We had a little bit of that going on internally with us and we had not really trained together adequately. We weren't compatible on radios yet. We didn't have all the stuff we needed, um, the trauma gear that you guys were getting really dialed in in those mid-2000s over in the sandbox. But after that gunfight, shit changed quick. Mm -hmm. And essentially, my partner survived that, but we kept him from bleeding out, and he just held on by sheer will for three hours waiting for an air rescue. And he was slipping into shock. He, he was losing color. He, you know, We were running out of trauma stuff to stop the bleeding, and I almost lost him. And what uh, were you, what were you carrying to stop the bleeding? Anything we had, we had a bunch of four by fours. We had some gauze and we had like one Israeli bandage. Hmm. And this was before, you know, cat tourniquets, it, every, you know, everybody was carrying them. It's before we were carrying and now a second dirty tourniquet. None of that was going on. We didn't have anticoagulant, you know, we didn't have uh, the quick clot or the sea locks. You mm -hmm. guys were just starting to use that over in the sandbox and it hadn't quite trickled over to us. But after that incident, and thankfully, you know, um, uh, Mojo, as he's called in in the first book, when we talk about that, this, the second chapter goes into that ordeal and why it kind of changed our perception of what wildlife criminals can be and what game wardens are going to have to do to really take this thing on environmentally. And not only for environmental reasons, but for public safety reasons and just domestic security for our sovereignty, if I really look at it deeper. Um, so we had a lot of failures that day. Mm. You know, we didn't know how much we were going to fail forward and learn from this, but uh, my partner survived. Uh, he was out of work for about a year. Uh, it would have been a career ender for most guys, but he was so motivated when he was in shock, Clint, and we were patching up his legs and we're holding a real tight perimeter. We got one, you know, one bad guy's down. There's another one crawling around that might be injured. We're too small of a team to even go out and counter track those guys and, and, and finish assessing the threat and see what we got to do. Um, 
he's looking at me like, oh man, I can't believe it. I'm going to miss that deer baiting case next weekend. The following weekend was the deer opener and we had a great <laughs> That's typical. baiting yeah. operation. Oh, he was just gung ho. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. buddy, don't worry about that deer case. <laughs> we're we're going to get you healed and we're going to worry about deer hunting later, you know, but um, no, he came back with a vengeance a year to the day and came oh, that's back. awesome and now he's a highly decorated lieutenant has a great family still working it and going to finish out his career but that that changed that changed my world man it really did it, it made me realize that all the other stuff is very important but i want to focus on this if my my admin will let me so i started immersing with the sheriff's office a lot i started stepping up the tactical training with with all those guys a lot more um and we just kept having more incidences where another gunfight in 07 um, that we almost, you know, took fire. Another go f- uh, gunfight in 2010 and then 2012. And it's just going on and on. And we hadn't really had the canine advent yet, right? And this is where mm. our mutual buddy, Mike Ritland, really resonated with this story of my canine handler and one of my best friends, who's uh, currently a, a lieutenant, still operational and not far from, you know, finishing his career out. But his amazing canine Phoebe, who just set records, I mean, in the country, not just in California, for a female Belgian Malinot of 70 pounds um, and became a real lifesaver. When I got to start working with them together and pull people from districts and we narrowly avoided a major gunfight, a major gunfight where it may not have fared well for me being so close to the action and having to deal with the dog bite and put that suspect down. And Brian's dealing with a, uh, an armed gunman that, you know, his dog's not even handling because she's got two threats now and we got one dog. That was a 2012 mission that I talked about in the new book, hidden war that made me realize, okay, I got to call the chiefs right now, give them a, a sit rep of what just went down. And we need to have this dog on every mission and we need to stop doing all this adjunct other work and if we're going to tackle this thing right, we need to tackle it as a unit and be dedicated. And with a really good chief that really believed in us, that was a mentor of mine in the academy way back in the 90s, um, we got that green light in 2013 when he became the leader of our, of our department. And it was very unorthodox to do a team like that in California, especially of game wardens, you know, or wildlife officers. Yeah. So you can imagine how tickled I was that that happened. Um, kind of blown away. And so now we didn't have any other patrol duties. We didn't have district boundaries. We reported straight to the chief main line up through special operations division. And we hit the ground running, man. We hit the ground running relentlessly for that whole first year, just had to prove ourselves. And it was mission after mission. It was millions of poison plants eradicated, hundreds and hundreds of cartel bad guy arrests, tons of weapons, um, you know, uh, marijuana plants, illegal marijuana plants that were taking hundreds of millions, if not billions gallons of water a year. Uh, and this is through one of the peak droughts that we had in California. That's now happening again in Cali as, as it is in other States. So when all that happened, I realized, Hey man, I mean, we're never going to stop it. You know, it's like stopping terrorism, right? Um, we're going to fight it the best we can and put the biggest dent in it. We can, uh, and that was our, that was our mission. That was basically our, our motto, you know, bite off what you can for every grow we raid. We know we're stopping some environmental damage and we know we're taking some bad people. that are going to do some real bad shit to our public, whether they're immersed in other cartel crimes or with this poison weed. You're listening to Can You Survive This Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Please make sure to subscribe, rate, and share on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite shows. 